Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Robbie Basil Show. You know who I am. I am Robbie Basil, your host, as per every other episode. And quick notes before we start, if the quality looks bad, and like you might hear some background noise, it is raining, and you see my, my umbrella right there. So uh, sorry if there's a little bit of like glare or anything. I can't do anything about that. Just the way the setup is. Hopefully, there will be better episode qualities in the future. Uh, one other announcement, there will be no, most likely, no episode on Friday. I'm going back home, and the timing of everything, you just I wouldn't be able to put out an episode that day. So, most likely, there will be a confirmation probably on Thursday for possible no episode on Friday. We'll go back to work on Monday and recap. This is mainly like the recap episodes, and then the previews are on Friday. So... Preview Friday, recap Monday, but most likely you will see no episode this coming Friday. I, I can't do anything about that. But what I can do is bring you guys this episode, and we're starting with football. The NFL was absolute chaos yesterday, and there were so many good games to talk about. But before we talk into the good games, we're going to talk about none of those games, and we're going to start with the Jets, because what else would I be talking about? And there's a lot of things to break down from this game. First off, the Cowboys look great. And from an unbiased perspective, they look great. And I could not talk highly enough about a lot of these players. And the first player I'm going to highlight from the Cowboys today is the efforts from Dak Prescott. I mean, that's the only thing I would start with. And he made the Jets defense look foolish. And what he did well was... A lot of these short, quick throws, getting the ball out of his hands very quickly. That's one thing that will torch the Jets defense from time to time is these QBs who go out with these short, quick throws, these five-yard, ten-yard routes, get the ball out of their hands right away to not let the Jets front forward make uh, cause any chaos. And the Cowboys really excel with that with that strategy. Mike McCarthy's play calling, I never thought it'd be this good, yet here we are. It looked really, really good. So Props to McCarthy, props to Dak Prescott. But I couldn't go without this without talking about C.D. Lamb's name. C.D. Lamb. He deserves an applause. He had a great game. 11 catches for 143. He was targeted a lot. One thing to note, though, he was targeted only once when getting guarded by Sauce Gardner, which begs the question, why wasn't he covered by Sauce the whole game? Maybe that's on Ulbrich. Maybe that's on Salah. I don't know. But uh, C.D. Lamb went 11 for 143. He looked really good. Uh, Tony Pollard had seven catches. Uh, this raises the question, why doesn't Mal Michael Gallup get catches if he's getting paid a lot of money? I, I don't got an answer on that one. But uh, Tony Pollard went 25 for 72. You got to give a lot of credit to the Jets' run defense for some plays, and then there's other plays where Tony Pollard just banged off consecutive like nine-yard runs and just pisses you off. So I don't know. But over to the Jets' side. And a lot of people are going to throw shade at Zach Wilson. And while I have been a defendant of Zach Wilson for a long time, this is an unbiased view. Zach Wilson should not be credited for losing this game. And some of the interceptions, the first one, bad. Second and third one. Look at the situations he was in. Down a lot, trying to make something for, make a deep throw a deep ball and hope for the best and that will happen and I, this is why like when the Jets were down a lot playing against a good defense like Dallas that those throws would work against a team like the Arizona Cardinals which we'll talk about in a minute but against a team like Dallas those throws will not work and that won't work against New England with New England next week I'll preview that game on into the stands on Thursday so make sure you tune into, into the stance for my full preview and not more breakdowns from this game because you're going to hear me break down this game here. You're going to hear me break down on Thursday. There's a lot of stuff to break down and make sure you guys check out Into the Stance. I'll leave a link to the previous Into the Stance episode in the description. And to cap off the Jets, there's frustration around the whole team. And this was a definition of a team loss. You cannot blame this on Zach Wilson. Offensive line, not very good. Defense, not very good. DJ Reed calling this the best defense in the league. Yeah, he, he got lit up by Dak Prescott. 
proving a lot of ESPN analysts right about Dak being good. I still think Dak is mid. He just had one of those really good games. Zach Wilson, yeah, we saw that Zach Wilson to Garrett Wilson connection. Again, he almost had two touchdowns. The second one, which was at the end of the first half, uh, Zach Wilson's arm got hit by a defensive end, and then there you go. It was almost an interception. So the Jets team, I don't think you can blame, like I said, not you can't blame this on Zach Wilson. It's a team loss. Zach Wilson took ownership for a little bit, which is, that just some it's made me feel better. Uh, there was an injury concern with Garrett Wilson. I have no information on that right now. I still have found nothing. They thought it was like um, got the wind knocked out of him or something on a throw on fourth down, which made sense, but it also could have been a knee injury. I don't know. I have no information on that on for you guys at this time. But make sure you can go follow any of the Jets analysts from Rich Simi, so of course Schefter, Rappaport, any of them. They'll probably have information on the injury. Because like I said, this video is recorded at 11 in the morning, and this video probably about like four-ish. So right now, no, I have nothing. I have no information on the injury concerns for Garrett Wilson. What I do have information on somewhat was the chaos from one New York team to the other. And we're going to head to the West, to out West next, to the desert, to Arizona, Giants, Cardinals. What, the, what was funny about this game was Colin, my roommate, you see on Into the Stance, by the way, as the TV there, and right here we had a laptop watching the Jets game. That Giants game, you could call it a lot of things. And this will sound, I, a lot of people will disagree with what I'm about to say. That's the most unjustified win I've ever seen from a Giants team in a couple of years. I don't know a more unjustified win. You're playing the Cardinals. You're down 21 if this was against any other team, I could say it's the Jets, the Colts, the Bengals. I don't know, Jacksonville, Tennessee. A lot of those teams I've mentioned will not let you come back in this game. The Cardinals are so bad and so poorly run, that was the only team you can perform a comeback like that against. Name me another team that the Giants would come back like that against. You can't say the Jets because the Jets would actually hold it down, hold the ball for a year. You can't name a team like the Buccaneers, who I haven't mentioned, who are 2-0, and by the way. You can't name like a team like the Falcons. Who else is bad enough to do what the Cardinals did? Really couldn't name you a team, right now at least. So, I don't... You can argue me all you want. There is no other team that, other than the Cardinals, who are clearly tanking, that will do what the, that will do what the Cardinals did on the field. The Giants wouldn't come back against any other team like that. Now, granted, you have to give credit to Daniel Jones. Didn't think I would say that. First half, awful. I think awful is an understatement. But Daniel Jones really came alive in the second half, made some big throws, threw a deep ball to Jalen Hyatt, and a fun fact, the Giants finally scored points, and this is what happens. So, riding off the Giants was something I may regret in the future, but you'll hear more about uh, some of those thoughts on Thursday. And I think the biggest moment of the game at half was halftime because Dable took over play calling duties. Now, if this was confirmed, which I believe it is by now, Brian Dable play calling, why wasn't he doing it before? I, I don't get it. Like, he was hired as an offensive specialist from Buffalo, of all places. And I believe he did a good amount of play calling last year as well. You guys can uh, write in the comments or DM me and say if I was wrong or not. So it's weird that Dable wasn't play calling before in the first half. Because if the Giants, if the Giants had the play calling of Dable in the first half, how much would the Giants be up by? I think they would be up by 20. I think they would be up by 27, 28, 30. They, I mean, I mean, if the Cardinal, I mean, I think it could have been even weirder. It could have been 21, 21 or 20, 28 at the half. Could it be looking at those old Big 12 showdown games where there's no one plays defense? And I would have loved to see that as a viewer. 
But from the Giants' perspective, people saying, oh, my God, we're back, you're not. Not yet. To me, at least. You've proven you can come back. Good. Good for you. That's a round of applause. Good for them. You haven't proven a lot of things to me yet. The defense. Can they play all four quarters? Can Daniel Jones play all four quarters? And I think we'll see that next week when uh, the Giants go out, come out. Or not even next week. They're on Thursday night football. And hear my preview of that on Into the Stands on Thursday. To the Cardinals' perspective, you got to give them credit and not credit them at the same time. But that's all I'll say on the Cardinals game for now. Other games to look at and concerns to raise, to be raised, is the better way I'll put it. And uh, we'll start. Where to start? You know, I'm going to just bring this game up for two seconds and just, I want to give another round of applause. I might blow up the mic at this point. From the effort by the Colts quarterbacks against te- against the Texans. Anthony Richardson. Hopefully he's okay with a possible concussion. Gardner Minshew, though, look competent. Granted, it's the Texans. So you can take it with a grain of salt. But there were a lot of positive takeaways from this game from both teams. First off, C.J. Stroud threw almost for 400 yards. I mean, could he break the curse of the second o- overall picks being mid? And the last one was a quarterback, I believe, was Zach Wilson. Maybe. I'm trying to blame what was last year, other than himself. So maybe he breaks, breaks the trend. I don't know. But um, a big day also for Nico Collins. I believe he may have gone to Michigan. I don't know where he's from, honestly. But he had seven for 146. And, I mean, it was a big day for Zach Moss on the ground. So it was a really big a fun game from this one. I mean, I wouldn't. I was not expecting that going in. I thought the Colts were going to win, but man, the Colts kind of made a statement to me. I mean, Anthony Richardson is phenomenal on the ground, and the Colts will be really good through their ground game, and that's why I think they're going to be a pretty solid, possibly a solid team. I don't know. That defense need to tighten it up, though. Other games to talk about. We'll talk about the Sunday night game in a moment. One other game. In the early slot to talk about, there's a couple of them. I mean, the afternoon slot was not that crazy. Actually, no, we'll talk about the afternoon game real quick, then we'll move on to the early slot again. Washington Denver was absolute madness. I mean, you saw Hail Mary get for a touchdown and then failed to get the two point. Broncos country. That's right. As the Broncos lost again. Listen. You, you go out, you throw 18 and 32 for 308. That's not a bad day from Russell Wilson. I mean, the problem is the Broncos don't have a running attack at all. Javante Williams went 12 for 44. Your leading rusher was Broncos country. Well, that's right. It's with uh, Russell Wilson. It's not sustainable. I mean, Sutton had five for 66 receiving. Marvin Mims had a touchdown on two for 113. So if you had your PPR leagues, he would have gone nuts for you. Uh, for the Washington side, Sam Howell had a great game, a yard, a tick under 300 yards with two touchdowns and no turnovers. Brian Robinson had 18 carries for 87 yards and two touchdowns. Big day for him as well. So for Washington, this is another big positive because you are tied for first in the division. And that's, I believe, the only division with a team that doesn't have a losing record. It should have been, but the Cardinals are the Cardinals. By the way, I'm never going to stop dissing this game. Uh, Giants fans, I'm never going to stop dissing you for that. But fair play to both of those teams because they've been in a hard fight. And listen, I think that game was just a culminary of what happened earlier with teams going down to the wire, fighting hard. Big days from both quarter for both quarterbacks, and that ge- I think that theme begun began I think I should say with the fight from Bengals Ravens. That was the first one because Joe Burrow I believe may have an ankle issue. I mean I was praising Joe Burrow in the last episode, and his team is zero two for the second year in a row I believe. Now granted, he's game against the Rams next, who lost last time out. But, you know what, I'll save that preview for next week, because next Monday, it's a Monday night game, that'll be my preview game. I'll save my thoughts for Joe Burrow then. Good game from Lamar Jackson, though. Good bounce back win for the Ravens. 
I believe that's a bounce back win for the Ravens. Oh no, they're two and out. My mistake. My mistake. They're two and out. Though, if you have to give me two more games to talk about, by the way, shout out to a Desmond Ritter and Baker Mayfield for both winning their matchups. Desmond Ritter is that guy. Listen, you can call my pick for the Falcons to win this division controversial. The dude threw for 237 yards, and he's a mainly rushing QB. I mean, he ran 10 times, also for 39 yards. This team ran 45 run plays and had a combined, I'm not very good at math, but we'll just say a tick under 200 rushing yards or at 200 rushing yards and one rushing touchdown. And Desmond Ritter had a passing touchdown as well. Uh, Drake London emerged from the ashes, unlike Kyle Pitts, proving the tight end position to be kind of useless. I was praising Kyle Pitts in my fantasy drafts, and I didn't draft Kyle Pitts. Maybe I should not have. I thank God I didn't draft Kyle Pitts. But Drake London had a solid game. The running attack is going to be amazing. Brian B. John Robinson, over 100 yards. He's proving me wrong, that's for sure. And then we, we have... One other game to talk about, also a quick note of the Rams 49ers. I almost forgot about this game. Brock Purdy, what are you doing? You're ruining my fantasy team. Though Christian McCaffrey is insane. Um, he had a rushing touch. All three touchdowns for them are on the ground. Questioning, um, I think they also may have had a pick six. I don't know. But they f- the defense forced turnovers courtesy of Demodere Lenoir and Isaiah Oliver. May have butchered the first name. I don't know. But CMC went crazy. Debo and Brock Purdy also had rushing touchdowns. But it was this game that caught everyone's attention. And other than Chargers Titans, which Justin Herbert had, he loses to the Titans. Seahawks Lions is my game. I think one of my other games of the day because I don't know if I talked about this on Friday, but this is, and I'll say this. Holy bounce back from Geno Smith. I was counting him out in week one. But week two, he says, hell no. Slaps you across the face and goes for over 325 yards. Fair play, Mr. Smith. Two touchdowns on in the air. Both of them to Tyler Lockett. Uh, Jason had five for 34. DK Metcalf, six for 75, but the big day was, of course, Lockett, eight for 59, two scores. The rushing attack led by Kenneth Walker, who had under 50 yards, yet two touchdowns. Take the positives with the, the ne- positives with the negatives, I guess. But for the Lions, uh, the questions about, around Jameer Gibbs continue. He is seven for 17, questioning why the hell they drafted him in the first place. Uh, you can actually question that with the Jets as well, by the way. Just just came out because Will Anderson was a healthy scratch. What are they doing? Uh, David Montgomery, 16 for 67. And uh, the big day was, of course, Amon Ross St. Brown. The Josh Reynolds had two touchdowns, as well as Khalif, uh, Khalif Raymond, who had a uh, receiving touchdown as well. He had, I, I believe, around 60 total yards. This game went to overtime. Lions fans complained about the overtime rules. Listen, you can argue multiple teams got screwed by overtime rules. Can't make that argument to me. You got lucky against KC. Seattle had all their weapons. You played them hard. You came back well. But don't come up to me about this OT BS. Can't do that. If you want to prove yourselves legit, go out and make a stop against Seattle when you had all the momentum. Can't do it. What are we doing? You go out and play hard in the, in the fourth, and you go out and lose. That's just what happened. But enough. I just know what? I almost forgot. Last night, Sunday Night Football. I almost forgot about this one. I think I I should not miss this at all. Tua, threw for 250 yards. The Dolphins defeat. Excuse me, uh, defeated the Patriots 24 to 17. Big days for Raheem Mostert, who had two rushing touchdowns. He had a day and a half. Uh, Tyree Hill had a touchdown as well, guiding the, the Dolphins' offense. Tyree Hill did not have over 100 yards. He only had 40, questioning how the hell did the Patriots come back from that, come get be in this game. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson had a touchdown. Hunter Henry had the receiving touchdown. And we saw almost the play of the year on fourth down for the Patriots. Uh, Mike Isicki made that catch. He tried to pitch it back to Cole Strange, former first-round pick, a guard first-round pick out of Chattanooga. And he tried to move both 
bull rush forward, and he was uh, half a half a yard short of the line to gain. So it was a turnover on downs. Patriots fans can complain all they want, but they're 0-2. But I think re-watching the highlights of this game this morning, I think the Jets should be very concerned about New England because, once again, the, the Patriots, quote-unquote, own the Jets, and they have for a long time. But I think, could we see the winds of change? I don't know. I mean, listen, the last time the Jets faced an 0-2 team in Week 2, 3 was last year. That was the Bengals. And then the Bengals won. So, and then they were like, won the, the thing called the division, and then they were pretty good in the playoffs. Had a great regular season. Could the Patriots continue that narrative? That's a question to be asked. But um, the Dolphins' defense looked better than I thought so far without Jalen Ramsey. Interested to see how they look next week, though, as the Dolphins um, will be playing the Broncos, who put up 33 on the, a decent-looking Washington defense. To the Premier League, and there are so many games I want to talk about, and we're going to start with none, once again, none of the games I talked about on Friday. Because one game, two games, really caught my attention. And United Brighton wasn't really one of them. Because Spurs and Sheffield United arguably was the best game of the day. Uh, Sheffield United goes up a goal in the 73rd minute courtesy of a hammer goal. And then the stoppage time in this game is just absolutely outrageous. And Richarlison scores. And then Kulisevsky scores two minutes later in stoppage time in the 90 and 100th minute to seal three points for Spurs. Now, I addressed the narrative with one of my friends how they could be having an Arsenal-type renaissance. I don't know if you what, you, what do you, what would you even call it? I don't even think renaissance is the right word for this. But the reason I bring up this term is because Arsenal, as last year, was known for those come-from-behind late wins against teams like Aston Villa, United, I think they've done it against a couple other teams. Now I'm probably forgetting. Tottenham's doing the same thing here. So could we see the, the narrative stay the same? I don't know. But looking at the rate, at the, the stats, because I love stats. You all know this. Uh, Tottenham had 2.1 XG. Sheffield United at 0.6. Uh, Tottenham also had 28 shots. So that you could say they deserved the win. They also had, had uh, over double the possession, which I'll – Tell you in a minute why possession doesn't really matter, but they outpassed them. They did everything better, and the stats proved they deserved the win, and they got the result. Granted, it was in the hundredth minute, and the Sheffield United manager was calling out the refs. But it's granted, the officiating in that game not very good, and it causes, as a referee myself, it causes more confusion on why these refs suck when they're so high level. I don't know. I, I don't know what to say on the rest right now. And enough about the BS refereeing from that match. We go to another game that was settled late because a team doesn't like to score goals in Crystal Palace. Who choked it and conceded three goals in 14 minutes in, in the 87th, 98th, and 101st to lose 3-1 to Aston Villa. Dur uh, Edward scored in the 47th minute for Palace, putting up, them up a goal to nil. And then Duran and Louise and then Leon Bailey. Uh, Douglas Louise scored a penalty in the 90th minute, which, by the way, was a pen. And then uh, Leon Bailey did Leon Bailey things like he would with the Jama Jamaica national team and scored the third goal, winning the match for Aston Villa 3-1 to one and putting them up to a very nice seventh position in the table. Uh, Aston Villa, seventh. Um, they have, con unfortunately, conceded a lot of goals. They have conceded the tied for the third most in the league at 10 goals. Teams have allowed double-digit goals. Luton Town, Burnley, Wolves, United, Manchester United, Fulham, and them, and Aston Villa. So, calls were concerned there. However... 
they have scored one of the most goals in the league with 11 goals. So their goal difference is one, but they have scored 11 goals. They know how to goal score. Palace doesn't. They have only scored six goals, which is the fewest out of a team in the top half of the table as of right now, which it's two less than the team that's in the next highest, the next lowest, excuse me, which is Brentford, who have eight. And actually, correction, they're the second lowest. I'm really messing up my nose here. Palace is this has scored the second fewest goals out of any team in the top ten. Fulham is has the least with five. Then it's then it's Palace, then it's Brentford, then Arsenal. Arsenal not scoring many goals. I mean, look at who they've played. I mean, they their most score, goal scores against Manchester United, which questions Manchester United entirely. But enough about uh, speaking. Excellent. We'll go from. Crystal Palace as well as to the walls of Manchester United, the aforementioned Manchester United. United, who lost 3-1 to one in a very well-deservingly 3-1 loss to Brighton. This team is in shambles. You can argue this team will be the Chelsea of last year. Proving how wrong we were. Me, myself, and Dylan were. You can question many things. My first one, why was Hoisland taken off? Why? Why? He was playing kind of good. He had some a lot of chances created, a lot of touches on the ball. He did a lot of good things defensively. He's aggressive. He's tall. He would have torched Brighton. And you pull him off in the 64th minute? Because to bring on, who did they bring him on for? Martial? Yeah. Bring on Martial for him. I mean, they also brought on guys like Garnacho. They brought off they threw out a lineup that you can argue was for multiple things. You can argue as resting players for the Champions League, which begins this week. You can argue it was for, by the way, Champions League prediction video is coming soon. It's, just, it's taking a long time. Don't worry about it. We'll be out soon. You can argue it was for, I mean, you can argue the lineup they threw out on the field is for the backups. You can argue that. Ten Hag didn't think that Brighton would be would be competent on the field. I mean, look who he threw out on, in the line. He threw out Scott McTominay. He threw out Christian Eriksen. He threw out, I mean, their fullbacks are not great. Lindelof at center back. I mean, they didn't start Juan Bissaka. They didn't start Garnacho. Granted, Juan Bissaka got injured again and will be out long term. So, question United. In short, United are going to have to make a choice. And they're going to have to do it before the Champions League match this week. What do you prioritize? League or Champions League? Now, me personally, if I was Arsenal in this situation, I would have prioritized the league and played the youngsters in the Champions League to get them that big game experience. Because the league, you can go out, you can get a very good position and qualify again, and throw, them out month, throw away money, and then go out and get more depth for next season and realize recognize your problems. Due to United's incompetence, I think they're going to focus on the Champions League as a, and they're going to make themselves look like an absolute fool. That's what Chelsea did. And they're going to follow that same mindset. You know, incompetent owners, bad team management, incompetent manager. You can go on and on and on about this, how this is exactly like Chelsea from last year, except they don't have the incredible depth like Chelsea had last year. So it's a little bit of a comparison. I think Manchester United and Chelsea are very similar. I mean, you can argue that's because I believe they're both very similar in the table. They are. They're right next to each other in the table. You can argue that United has looked terrible in almost all of their matches. I mean, let's look over their results. Because it's not very good. You beat Wolves. You deserve the win. You lost the top. Actually, no, sorry. You beat Wolves. I messed up my notes again. You beat Wolves. Deserve the draw. That's the way I'm going to work. You lost to Tottenham, you deserve to lose. You beat Nottingham, you deserve to beat Nottingham. You lost to Arsenal, you should have lost by... I mean, I granted United should have had another goal, but Arsenal couldn't finish anything in front of their own nets. You deserve to lose, and you deserve to lose again. Granted, I think the strategy, looking over their schedule again, again, uh, and me rec rec remembering, my God, remembering that United plays Burnley next in the league, I think you can prioritize the Champions League for this match. And then, you know, they get the EFL Cup and then they get Crystal Palace twice in the Cup of the League. 
and they got Galatasaray, and then they have a e- decently easy schedule coming up. So I'm very, like I said, in short, very interested to see how Manchester United prioritize. Fulham beat Lewintown in a match that I didn't think I'd be talking about, but Vinicius scored a goal for Fulham. For Fulham. And then Liverpool. Just not doing anything in the first half. They did, they did beat Wolves, though, 3-1. to Man City beat West Ham in a match that I did, uh, really disappointed me. A Ward Prowse scored, and then West Ham just fell asleep in the second half. Doku scored, then Bernardo Silva, and then, um, and then Holland scored. Julian Alvarez, man of the match, 8.8 rating. Pretty solid performance from him. And then the final game from Saturday, Newcastle beat Brentford on a penalty from Callum Wilson. Why is Newcastle concerning me now? A 1.44 XG, but they got outshot by Brentford. Possible concerns there. Yesterday, we had Arsenal beat Everton in a match that I thought would be like a million to nothing. But little did I know that Martinelli, Mark Gabriel Martinelli had a chance to score in the 19th minute, but the goal was VAR and disallowed. We had um, then, uh, uh, un- unfortunately, uh, Martinelli got a nut, picked up a knock, and Leandro Trossard came on the field, who which speculated the narrative that whoever was going to play that position was going to score the goal. Why? He Trossard scored the goal that won Arsenal the match. And if you look at the statistics, Arsenal had more XG, seventy four percent percent possession in this match, raising more questions about Arsenal. How many shots do they have? Thirteen. Committed less fouls. They had 11 corners, maybe raising questions about their set pieces. I mean, they had four shots on target. They had a little ton of shots that were unfortunately blocked. But listen, they had only 0.83 XG from open plays. So Everton defense is really freaking good. But, I mean, the Brexit old style of play, proving once again that you can't be a big six team with this mentality, Everton. Figure it out. Their, their defense, though, is, I, I will like, keep pointing it out. Pretty good. Most expected goal XG was from Fabio Vieira and not Trossard, which is fun to note. But the other matchup, which I'm going to clown some fans for real quick, is Chelsea drawing Bournemouth. I don't know if I said Chelsea would draw Bournemouth on. Uh, on Friday, but what the heck am I watching at this point? Bournemouth to Chelsea. Chelsea did have more XG, more possession, more barely one more shot than Bournemouth. Uh, they have better passing. They committed more fouls than Bournemouth. They committed 20 fouls, showing their lack of discipline. But if you look at the ratings from Chelsea, yeah, and Mudrick, seven. Nicholas Jackson, 6.4. Enzo, 6.7. Your best player by rating was your goalkeeper. And then your players on the field was their right back, Malo Gusto, who I've never heard of before. How is this possible? You're Chelsea. My God. This team is a mess. Pochettino needs to figure it out fast. You are going to have injuries. To Benoit Badia Shile, Chukawemeka, Nkunku, Moises Caicedo, Reese James, Romeo Lavia, Chalaboa, Wesley Fofana. They had a lot of players injured or suspended, with Saar being suspended. So Chelsea are a mess. Shout out to Bournemouth for getting a result. I've really praised Bournemouth here. Because, listen, they were in that, like I mentioned on Friday, they were in that match with Liverpool, who are better than Chelsea. Disappointed though that Bournemouth didn't win this though. And then we have the match of today, which I talked about already with Nottingham Forest and Burnley. I'm predicting a draw. Now I'm predicting a draw. I don't know what I said on Friday. So a lot of fun. And of course, the Champions League is this week. Uh, matchups briefly to watch out for in the Champions League. Any group group F matchup, you have to watch it. Um, we open with a Milan-Newcastle, a match that AC Milan will need to bounce back from after their embarrassing loss to Inter 5-1 over the weekend in the Milan Derby. Newcastle, of course, looking to see if they're actually a competent team in the Champions League. And then PSG plays Dortmund in a match that's an automatic draw to me. PSG, not inspiring. Dortmund, they're pretty solid. I'm writing this up as an immediate draw. Other matches to watch out for? 
possible underrated game to watch for. I'm going to go with Lazio and Atletico Madrid. Uh, you can watch all these games on uh, the Paramount I mean, Paramount Plus. And you can watch the goal. What I did during the Champions League last year, which was the, watch the Golasso Network. Not the Golasso Network. The Golasso Show on CBS Sports Network. I don't know if it's still there because they have the Golasso Network now. But I did watch that a lot last year. And it was able to like show me from goals to highlights to all that other stuff. So that's how I would recommend. But the Group E matchups, I think, are very fun to start as well on Tuesday. Wednesday, United Bayern is going to be probably one of the matches to watch out for. But I think Union Berlin will cause Real Madrid problems. I don't think that match is going to be an absolute blowout. But you have you know, Thursday in Euro- Europa or Conference League and Europa League matches. I'll just preview one of them real quick if my thing will load. Let me see if there's any other good matches. Ajax and Marseille in a match that I, I think is really interesting. I believe Brighton's in that group as well. As you can say, it will be the battle of the development clubs with Ajax and Brighton developing all their good talents. That matchup eventually, will, I think, will be very fun. But, I mean, a team to watch out for in early in the Europa League, because I'm not talking about it in the Champions League video, is freaking Roma. Who showed out this weekend? You know, they won seven to nothing. They play Sheriff, I believe it's in Moldova. They're playing in Tiraspol, North Moldova, which on a map, just try to find Moldova on a map. Now, that'll be fun, but so Sheriff is inf- infamously known for like being that group of Real Madrid and causing absolute chaos. And then they beat Real Madrid. I You have to fact check me on that one, but I think they may have beaten Real Madrid. There's a lot of. Interesting matchups in the Conference League. Team to watch out. Matchup to watch for. I'm going to go with Club Bruges and Besiktas um, in Belgium. And listen, I like Besiktas a lot. Their team is a lot of fun. When you go watch that team in Turkey, I believe they're in Turkey. Um, Besiktas. Let me just make fat check me on that one. I believe they're from Turkey. Yeah, they're from Turkey. Any of those Turkish teams have some of the most interesting fan bases I've ever seen. If you want to watch teams with interesting fan bases, uh, in Europa, Europa Conference League, Besiktas, I mean, I'm going to go with Ajax. I'm going to go with, um, where are they? Where are my boys from? I'm going to go with Marseille. I'm going to go with Eintracht Frankfurt. And there's a ton of teams I totally missed out on, but. There's a lot of fun matchups in Europa and Europa Conference League, not only just the Champions League, but those two tournaments as well. Those matchups I just mentioned are on Thursday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, a lot of fun European action to watch out for. And I can't wait to watch all of it. Possibly break it down here and there for you guys. Now to our uh, the concluding topic of this afternoon, and that is Singapore. The Singapore Grand Prix. Now, I talked about it. This on the Starting Grid podcast. I was with them over the weekend. Uh, last night and Saturday, I may have gotten owned by Shane last night. Shout out to my guys, Shane and Rome. They're awesome guys. Make sure to check out their episode. They have a ton of great guests. Not just me, but multiple others that I'm just forgetting the list in my head. But they have had some phenomenal guests and a lot of great insight from a lot of different people. Make sure you go check out the Starting Grid podcast. And they talked about this race very well from last night. Uh, the race result, let's just briefly talk about the race. It was insane. I cannot speak more highly of this race at all. The new look Singapore looks great. And I did not expect that going into this race. Was my top three right? Absolutely not. But you got to give a lot of credit to certain drivers. I talked about this point last night. I'm going to talk about it again. Carlos Sainz winning is I guess it's controversial, but my guy Shane brought up an interesting point last night where when we recorded and posted the episode where he said that Carlos Sainz will be the face of the, of the brand. And I don't like that idea. And I said that yesterday as well. And the reason I say that is if Carlos Sainz is a pre-agreement with another team, then why wouldn't you prioritize the number one driver to be the guy that's going to stay loyal to the brand? Just something to think about. It's a weird one. I, I, I questioned a lot of things from this race. Shout out though to Lando Norris. You got P2. His second is tied for his highest ever result in an F1 car. He's gotten P2 a lot. Will he ever get a win? I, wa- I wanted him to win yesterday. I really did. 
but you couldn't get it done. Hamilton P3, Leclerc P4, Max Verstappen, you're wondering where he was. He's in P5. Followed by Gasly, a mega drive from Piastri, Sergio Perez, Liam Lawson, and K Mag. Now, I t- some of the notes from this race. I didn't think Haas was gonna get, were going to get points from this, and they did, and they proved me wrong. Uh, I thought Albon was going to overtake Magnussen towards the end, and he couldn't find a way to do it. But a mega drive from Liam Lawson, guys. Could Liam Lawson be the next big Red Bull Academy driver to go on and make a move and be really good in F1? I made a comparison to him and DeVries as an overreaction to one good result. And I think this is the worst scenario for Daniel Ricciardo. Now, Danny Rick, I think, deserves that Alpha Tari scene no matter what. It What Lawson is doing is putting Yuki Tsunoda and Daniel Ricciardo on notice. Because I think Lawson should get the seat. I think Tsunoda should get axed. So, I want to see Daniel in Red Bull. He is the definition of a number two driver. He should be the number two driver at Red Bull right now. I, I don't like Sergio Perez. So I, that's probably why I'm saying that. But I don't think it would be, would be smart by Red Bull to rush this decision and sign him to an Alpha Tari C right away. I'm, I'm going to need to see more from him. Uh, I don't know if there's another race before Qatar. I think there might be, honestly. Oh, Japan next week. So... If Lawson gets points in Japan, then what? Then would Daniel Ricciardo even come back to the seat? It's a it's just a rhetorical question. I'm interested to see what you guys think about this. But I mean, unfortunate from George Russell, uh, he was in third, having a great race. Could have overtaken Lando. The Mercedes cars were very fast. And I think Hamilton said it well at the end in this his, his press at the end where he said that he was disappointed that he thought Mercedes he could have gone into one, two. And I think I kind of have to agree with him there. Mercedes car looked pretty good. I mean, I said on Saturday, I'm disappointed in Hamilton's performance. I was. And I, I don't know if I you can argue that he I'm disappointed again because he made up positions and he got on the podium. It's, I think it's his 196th career podium. You're going to have to correct me on that one. But Hamilton, listen, Mercedes could have won that race. I think three constructors could have won that race yesterday. Could have been a Ferrari. Could have been a McLaren. Could have been a Mercedes. It's good to see, though, that Red Bull. I mean, Max made up a lot of places. Got to give him credit. But when you go out and say that, I don't know how many, how much, how much, how many moves I'm going to be able to make on the drivers because of the track, then it gives teams a lot of confidence. And I think this result will give teams confidence heading to the rest of this season and next season. Japan's next. Who do I think is going to win that? No idea. But if you want insight on that race, it's, I'm not having a podcast probably on Friday. Make sure you check out the Starting Grid podcast. You'll hear those guys on Saturday and Sunday. But on that, that will be the end of today's episode for the Robbie Basil show. Thank you guys so much for watching today's episode. If you like what you see, hit the like button down below, subscribe to the channel. Uh, links in the description will be for my podcast. I'm uh, sorry, my latest episode here. You'll see the latest episode from Into the Stands. That's on Thursday at 5 p.m. on the WIUR, Iona Gales Radio Network on YouTube. So make sure you can maybe go even hit a subscri- subscribe button to them as well. Make sure to check out all the other great shows on WIUR. There's a couple of good, there's a lot of good ones this year. Pretty solid ones. And hopefully maybe you can see a guest, me appear on those shows. Or they even come here. Who knows? If there's ever, by the way, a specific guest you want, hit me up on Instagram at rbasil underscore 11. DM me. Let me know who you think it is. And I'll give them some consideration for sure. But on that note, I'm Robbie Basil saying so long. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. When will it be? Make sure you follow my Instagram and see my Instagram story on Thursday to find out. But for now, goodbye, guys.